you also make a distinction between progressive Christianity and historic Christianity. Yes. So why don't we talk about that a little? Sure. Well, I, I tried to find a word that would describe the opposite of progressive Christianity. So maybe we can define okay. progressive Christianity and then I'll kind of give you why I chose the word historic. It's not perfect. There's no perfect word to use. But so progressive Christianity is the idea that pr Christianity itself is progressing. So what I mean by that hmm. is, of course, we want progress, right? As Christians, we want to progress in our faith. Seems like a good thing. Seems like a good thing. We want to we want to grow in our relationship mm -hmm. with God and in our knowledge. We want to be mature. We don't want to be infants. Yes. In our, yeah. We want to progress, but there's a difference between us progressing in our understanding of the eternal truths of God mm -hmm. and those truths themselves evolving and changing and progressing. Right. So in the progressive view. What Moses wrote, well, they probably wouldn't even think Moses wrote it, but what the Old Testament prophets wrote about God speaking wasn't really God speaking. That was them speaking what they believed about God in their time and place. Mm -hmm. And and so Peter and Paul, they don't really like Paul very much. They were writing their best understanding. This was Christianity in its infancy. This was the best they could do to understand God in their times and places. And so now we're we're evolving into a higher and wiser view of God. In fact, that's the phrase that one of the fathers of the movement, Brian McLaren, uses, a higher and wiser view of God. We can look at what uh, the Old Testament writers wrote, what the New Testament writers wrote, and we can analyze that and go, well, I think they got this right. I don't think they got that right. I think that was influenced by pagan culture. And then we can understand God better now. And so that's what progressive Christianity actually means. This is why you can have two progressive Christians that might completely disagree on the resurrection. One might affirm it, one might not. But they're perfectly fine to be in unity with each other because it's really not about the specifics of what you believe. Mm -hmm. It's about growing together and discovering what Christianity is going to mean now in today's world. Okay, so going back to the definition of, so that's progressive Christianity. What is historic Christianity according to you? So I knocked around a lot of different ways to describe this. I, I thought about traditional Christianity, but I don't like that because that carries baggage for people in their specific traditions. Yeah. Uh, conservative. It seems outdated. It's it like, seems outdated. I don't and conservative yeah. has like a political feel because mm -hmm. it's not about politics. And so I, I went with historic because when I was at my darkest time, what I realized was that in the class I was in, a lot of the people were leaving the type of Christianity they grew up with. And I thought, well, if I'm going through all this doubt about if what I believe is even true, I don't want to just reject what I was raised with. I want to make sure if I reject it, I'm rejecting the real thing. And so I went on a quest to find out what the real historic version of Christianity is. Now, what I don't mean by historic is that it's every iteration of Christianity since its inception is included in that. Obviously, Christianity has gone off course mm -hmm. uh, at times. You know, that's why we had the Reformation. Uh, but when I'm talking about her historic Christianity, I'm talking about starting with what it looked like in its earliest form. What did Christians believe, the earliest Christians? So here I'm thinking of like the Apollo, the, the uh, um what is it? The Apostles' Creed, yeah. the Nicene Creed. Is that what you're kind of referencing there? No, I'm at. No? Well, I mean, I affirm those, but I'm going earlier. I, in fact, I start with the early, what's arguably the earliest creed, in in uh, the Christian history, which is we find it in 1 Corinthians 15, which was written years later. But virtually all scholars, from secular to atheist to conservative, all agree that this creed was written between three and seven years of Jesus' resurrection. It's the creed we, that Paul records for us in 1 mm -hmm. Corinthians 15. I know that some people even date it to within like a couple months. After yeah, in fact, the, it, what's funny about that is is some of the Jesus Seminar guys who are even the, like the fringe liberals will yeah. date it really, really early. Mm -hmm. And so we know even Bart Ehrman, these skeptical scholars will say this was this was the belief of the early Christians. Okay. Like Paul didn't make this up. He recorded this. And so what you find in that creed is that Jesus died for our sins. I mean, it seems so simple for some of us, but, but that's there, that Jesus died for our sins. And that's connected according to the scriptures. That he was buried and resurrected according to the scriptures. And then Paul says before he puts the creed down, he says, this is the most important thing. This is of utmost importance. So to me right there, that says that there are distinctions between essentials and non-essentials. Hmm. This is the most important thing. And so in that creed, what united the earliest Christians, you have 
the, the atonement of Jesus, you have the resurrection of Jesus, and it mentions according to the scriptures twice. So their beliefs were inextricably linked to the authority of the scriptures. And so that's how I would define the earliest version of Christianity. Now you can extrapolate from there. Right. Well, what does it mean Jesus died for our sins? And for that, we, we go to the earliest Christians writing about it. We go to the New Testament writers. We go to what Jesus thought he was doing. Uh, we go to the early church fathers. And uh, you know, there's all these different theories of atonement and there were different theories that were more emphasized throughout church history than others, of course. But, but you have that concept of Jesus dying for my sins in a substitutionary sense from the earliest iteration of Christianity, which is largely something that the progressive church denies. So let's take a step back and talk a little more about deconstruction and the role that plays in the progressive movement, the way that you've yeah. defined the progressive movement. It's, it's really a rite of passage in, in a way. If you're gonna consider yourself a progressive Christian, you're probably either already gone through a process of deconstruction or you're beginning your process or you're somewhere in your process. So do they call it deconstruction? Yes, okay. yeah, there's podcasts that invite people on to talk about their deconstruction pro uh, process and, and it's, it's, That's it's bizarre a, to me. Is it? Yeah. yeah. It's a little weird. It's a little yeah. weird. Yeah, like, well, I think it because, but this is why though. I think, in fact, I was talking to, about this with someone the other day. I don't personally know anyone and I haven't come across anyone in my research or in all of my reading of progressive books and listening to podcasts who converted into progressive Christianity from another worldview or from atheism. Uh, almost all the converts, well, all the ones I can think of that are, that are embracing this progressive Christianity are coming out of the evangelical church. They grew up largely in the evangelical church. And so hmm. uh, I think that they're reacting against maybe some of the wacky things they grew up with, uh, but but that's why the deconstruction happens because all of a sudden they go, well, I've always believed this because mm -hmm. my parents and my Sunday school teachers told me to believe it and I don't really know why. And so they start picking it all apart. 